Pastor Paul's Kids Talk. Steve the stick man tells a story of the healing of a man who could not walk. Near the sheep gate in Jerusalem, there was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda, meaning the house of mercy, with five alcoves. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed, were in those alcoves. One man had been unable to walk for 38 years. His whole life was lying by the pool. When Jesus saw him stretched out by the pool and knew how long he'd been there, he said, Do you want to get well? The sick man said, Sir, when the water is stirred, I don't know anyone who can help me in the pool. By the time I get there, somebody else is already in. Jesus said, Get up, take your bedroll, start walking. The man was healed on the spot. He picked up his bedroll and walked off. It was totally amazing. Jesus healed him. Another miracle. God is so good. Friends, the Bible tells us in this story that God can do absolutely everything. The things we might think are impossible are not for God. Let's first of all thank God right now. And let's pray for the things that we know need to change, get healed, and then trust God to do it. Oh, Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you for this story where Jesus heals the impossible. And we think about our own lives. We think about our family, our friends. And we ask you, Lord, to come in your power and do the impossible. We trust you, we love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All of us come to Jesus with some kind of need, and he is always sufficient for every need that any one of us may have. But there are times when the needs of some people is, is so great, and the situation might be so miserable that, humanly speaking, it seems utterly hopeless and impossible. Many of those who are in such a, a condition have pretty much given up any hope of being any different. And they keep on doing the same old things over and over that can never relieve them of their misery. And that certainly describes the situation of a crippled man in today's Gospel reading. Later on in our service, we're going to look at his encounter with Jesus and how that changed everything. 
Welcome to our service. That I see 
Please join me in praying the Colic for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts, that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially when we come together in His presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at His hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. And let's pray for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's once again reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the word of God. Our scripture reading for this week is from the Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. 
And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before we begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we're looking at the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Notice in this picture a pool has been found with the requisite five colonnades and located in the north quarter of the old city of Jerusalem, and has been confidently identified by archaeologists as the pool in the story. A reminder that we are dealing with history, not a legend, but a real miracle or sign of God's power. The pool was fed by some kind of underground natural spring and was known as a place of healing. Just as in some places around the world, where there is some kind of hot spring or something, and often people flock to those places to receive its benefits. At the Pool of Bethesda, which was known as the House of Mercy, the waters in the pool would bubble up periodically, and when that happened, it was believed that the person to get in would be healed. At the time, there was even a popular belief that an angel was stirring up the water. Here's another picture taken from a movie. And so we can imagine the pool looking something like this in Jesus' day. If you are not using the King James Version of the Bible, you may have noticed in your Bible that there's no verse 4. But probably there's a footnote at the bottom of the page which says something like, For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. Many scholars believe this is a later addition to the original Greek text. That's why it's not in most Bibles today. But it does highlight how superstitions may arise when it comes to people's desperation for some kind of healing. Look at verse 3. In this place lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. 38 years, the man could not walk. That's almost the same amount of time that the people of God were wandering in the wilderness. Not being able to walk for 38 years would make anybody, 
would leave any sufferer so weak that they would probably have needed help to even get to the pool. We would say he is in a desperate situation, a hopeless case, as it were. 38 years of past suffering, not able, as it were, to do the everyday things that most people take for granted. You would feel like an absolute outcast. In a sense, we all have things in our past that wound and sometimes absolutely cripple us. It can be very, very dark. So Jesus encounters someone who would have been a regular at the pool. And Jesus questions him, do you want to be healed? Pretty obvious, right? The question, do you want to get well, may have been intended to jolt the man out of his apathy. But the answer does not reveal any faith on the man's part. Clearly, the paralytic thought in rather magical terms, as verse 7 shows. He believed the commonly held view that only the first to get into the water had any chance of healing. But I think Jesus is appealing to more. Perhaps the man's will is crippled. His spirit is broken. Thus, the challenge of the question. After all, being crippled for 38 years would get anyone to the place of giving up, having no hope, and leaving him with a dull despair. Or perhaps another reason why Jesus asked the question is that if he was cured, he might have to work. Maybe Jesus was hinting that a cure has its implications, particularly when his condition lasted so long that a whole way of life had been built up around it, not able to work, begging for a living. We're not sure. Perhaps we know people today who don't want to be healed either. They do not want to receive any kind of divine help in their problems. They don't want to be helped out of their weakness. And strangely, some people like their weaknesses their helplessness. They're always craving the attention of others because of their sorry condition. They sometimes flee, assuming responsibility even in their own lives. I recall hearing Pastor John Wimber of the Vineyard Christian Fellowship teaching his church, and especially people who were praying for others, to question those who came for healing. And too often we assume that a person wants one thing while they just aren't where we imagine them to be. And since I've learned this, when people come to me for prayer or come forward at one of our services, I usually ask, what do you want God to do for you? And that helps me to discern how to pray for the person. And as I pray to God for wisdom, Occasionally, I get that kind of picture, that guidance on how I should specifically pray. But maybe in our story, the man really did want to be healed. In other words, yes, I want to be healed, but I can't. I've tried. I've done everything I know how. I want to get into the water. I want to be healed, but I lack the ability. I've no one to help me. I've given up. I have no hope. And again, some of us can relate to that. They've given up on their situation, refusing to believe there's any hope things can change. They see no way from a human viewpoint. So they've resigned themselves to what it's going to be like for the rest of their lives. And that reminds me of something from C.S. Lewis' classic book, The Great Divorce. Amazing book. It's a dreamlike story of a group of people who are offered a trip to heaven. And in one part of the story, a man from earth stands face to face with an angel. 
And on this man's shoulder is this horrible, disgusting lizard-like creature that keeps whispering things to, into the man's ear. In C.S. Lewis' parable, the lizard is representative of lust, and it keeps chattering into the man's ear while the man snarls at it and tells it to be quiet. The angel asks the man, would you like me to make him quiet? And the man says, of course I would. Then I will kill him, the angel says. But as the angel moves his hands towards the lizard, the man backs off in horror. He didn't want anything as drastic as that. The angel tried to explain that it was the only way to deal with it. And so he kept asking the man, may I kill it? The man offered all kinds of alternatives. Let's do it later. Don't bother. Look, it, it's gone to sleep. I don't think killing it is necessary. I think it's a gradual process. Things will get better. I'd like you to kill it, but I'm not really feeling very well today. I'd really like to get a second opinion. Clearly, there was a sense in which the man liked having this lizard that he hated so much. But still, the angel kept patiently asking for permission. May I kill it? Finally, the man bursts out. How can I tell that if you kill it, you might kill me too? And so the angel convinces him that killing the lizard won't kill the man. And so with great fear and trembling, the man finally gave the angel permission. The angel killed the lizard and threw it off the man and onto the ground. And then a wonderful thing happens. Freed from the thing, the lust, that held him in misery and in slavery, the man was transformed into a being almost as glorious as the angel himself. And what's more, the lizard itself was transformed into a glorious white shining stallion for the man to ride upon. And away he and the stallion rode in thankfulness and with great joy. I believe that the Lord wants to set us free from the many miseries that might bind us. He is even able to turn hopelessness of our misery into something glorious and good if we allow the Lord Jesus to do it. But he first challenges us to truly want to be whole and well by him. He challenges us to become completely willing to be made free from all of the shackles and even the subtle, we might think, secret benefits of the misery that binds us. He first makes us probe our hearts and ask, do you want to be healed? Are you ready to be changed? Do you want to change? Do you want to be healed? Or do you want to stay just the way you are. And notice in the story, the crippled man's response is immediate. Jesus said to him, get up, take your, up your bed and walk. Jesus asks him to basically do the impossible, to stand up. And of course, it works. Often in Jesus' encounter with people, there is a response needed. Obviously on our own, we cannot make things happen. But it seems to be a pattern in the Bible that when our will and God's power cooperate, there is the amazing possibility of God doing the impossible. Get up. In other words, attempt the impossible. Sometimes I think when I'm praying for someone or, or, or praying for some very difficult situation, I'm basically being asked to pray and hope for the impossible. But as the story encourages us and illustrates, God is the God of the impossible. Our job is to cooperate, to pray, to hope, to ask for the impossible and God knows something wonderful is going to happen. 
That is a critical clue many miss they are look, when they're looking for help from God. There's always something God tells them to believe and do and act upon. Jesus' word to the man is basically a word of action. Jesus does not say, well, you know, try to build up your faith in your mind. Try to fasten your thoughts on this or that. He tells him to do something. Rise. Stand up. Obviously, it was Jesus' will that this man do what he told him to do. And the moment the man's will agreed with the Lord's will, the power was released. I don't know whether the man felt anything or not. All I know is that strength came into his bones and into his muscles and he could stand. He trusted he could stand and he did. And it's interesting to me also is that when Jesus says, rise up, it is the same word used at the resurrection. In this miracle or sign, as we saw also in the previous two in our study, the healing of the royal official's son, and even in the miracle of the water turned into wine, Jesus is bringing new creation, new life. It is bursting into the present world, bringing healing and new possibilities. Wonderful. The word sign does not occur in this passage. But by now, St. John is expecting us to be counting for ourselves. Our story today illustrates that the crippled man is basically given a brand new life. And at once, the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now, the day was the Sabbath. It's interesting that the outcome of this amazing miracle is twofold. He's healed and a controversy is about to arise since the healing took place on the Sabbath. And as you know, work was prohibited on the Sabbath. At the hotel that we were staying in Jerusalem a couple of years ago, I remember that on the Sabbath, Saturday, the hotel would put up screens in front of the main desk so that I suppose the, the Jewish guests would not be able to see the staff working at their jobs, serving the other guests. Now, that was a first for me. But in Jesus' day, it was far more strict. In fact, there was about 39 different classifications of work, and one of which was something like carrying a bedroll. They even argued, I've learned, that it was illegal to wear false teeth or, or, or a wooden leg. They were quite clear that any kind of brooch could not be worn on the Sabbath. Sorry, any of you brooch wearers. Carrying anything, including basically a mat, was forbidden because it was considered work. We know that often that Jesus got into trouble with the religious authorities who had many different interpretations and stipulations of the fourth commandment. Thou shalt not work on the Sabbath, honor the Sabbath. Many of us even can remember when stores were closed on Sundays. But in Jesus' day, it was a major faux pas. Exodus chapter 20, we find the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And just as God worked, as it were, for six days, creating the universe and then rested, his people are to have a day of rest. And could we say, that Jesus is starting a new creation. He is making this man walk. He is doing a creative, powerful new work. Look at verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath 
It's not lawful for you to be taking up your bed. But the man answered them, The man who healed me, the man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. His explanation was that the man who had healed him told him to do it. Pretty sorry excuse. He didn't even know who Jesus was. Verse 12. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, probably thanking God, and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. Now, do the words of Jesus suggest that the man's illness was the result of a specific sin? Even if the answer is yes, this would not imply that all physical illness has a specific moral cause. However, it may be that Jesus was warning about a moral lameness, as it were, which would be worse than the physical lameness from which the man had just been delivered. And you and I know there are some things in people's lives and attitudes that are far worse than some kind of physical problem. Last two verses. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. God, as we know, is unlimited in his creative healing power. And he constantly invites us to prayer and basically be catalysts of his power as we pray and minister to others in union with with the Lord Jesus Christ. And like Jesus, we can enter into the work we see our Father in heaven doing. In this gospel, according to St. John, there is a close relationship between the works of Jesus and the works of God. And verse 17 concisely sums up the mission of Jesus. My Father is working, I am working. To the religious leaders, the idea of anyone making himself equal with God would have been a far worse serious offense than breaking the Sabbath law. But isn't that the point that St. John is highlighting? Jesus is doing things that only God can do. Because, as John clearly indicated in John chapter 1, Jesus is the Word made flesh, God incarnate. Sign number three, the healing of the pool at Bethesda, is another example of God Almighty working through Jesus. To get us to the point of saying, who is this man? I believe in him. I trust in him. I give my life to Jesus. And what Jesus said is true for us today. God is working in the year 2022. He's working in international events. He's working in the pressures and problems that come to each one of us. He is working in the very circumstances in which you find yourself today. And what you need to know is where is God moving in your life and then work with him? You see, the only thing that lasts, that gives significance to life, and every one of us, of course, wants to be significant, is to be in line with what God does. Only God's work will truly last forever. And so let us leave now with this question that Jesus speaks to each one of us. In some area of your life, 
Do you want to be healed? Do you want to change? Do you want a new start? And if you say yes, the Lord will probably say, then stand up, take up your bed and walk. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, who loves us, who is filled with compassion, who meets us in our need. And Lord, we have many needs, both for ourselves and for our friends and family. Things that are physical in nature, things that are spiritual in nature, emotional things, all kinds of different issues, Lord. We would say, come Holy Spirit. Lord, we want to be healed. We want to change. We want more of you. Come Holy Spirit. Do the impossible. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley, Bishop Charlie, Coadjutor Bishop elect Dan, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, our Premier. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection and thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we especially want to lift up to you this week all the new Christians around the world. Lord, use us and, and, and other uh, believers to come alongside them and um, help them to live this new life of faith that they have. Uh, use us to build them up, to um, teach them in the way of truth and to instruct them in how to read and interpret scripture. We also ask, Lord, that, that you would use St. Hildas to uh, further your kingdom here in Oakville and the surrounding area. Lord, use us to draw people to your kingdom so that they can find new life in you. Grant us the privilege and the joy of leading people into a relationship with you. We also ask that you would um, bless and inspire and move those who are um, coming to a point where they might rekindle their faith in you. Lord, help them to understand the forgiveness that you will offer to them if they will uh, come to you in repentance and faith. We also want to pray this week for all those who are grieving the loss of a family member, a friend, or another uh, kind of loved one. Lord, please give them peace and comfort during this difficult time. Once again, we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And together we pray, Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory, throughout all ages. Amen.
friends, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless your week.